the Second World War no. really to, to to enjoy this. No, no, it's 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 all there. I love that it's a second chance too. Pip, what yes. are you going to give it? Drum roll. <sighs> Did you really enjoy it? I reckon a seven and a half. It only got a seven and a half on the enjoyment factor. Maybe eight. Yeah, yeah, I'll go eight. Go eight. Okay. I'll go eight. Yeah, that's very strong for you. I know, but yeah. it was actually a lovely storyline. I thought all the actors did a fabulous job. Yep. I actually was rather impressed. Excellent. All so, right. Yeah. So eight stars from me and nine stars from Paul for T34. T34. Now, yes, so what I'm going to do is uh, put on a speech that I found for uh, that was done by Jim Carrey and he's addressing uh, university graduates sort of thing. And it's a, it's a, uh, I think it's it's his own thoughts and feelings and everything like that. But I think there's just an awful lot of good stuff that you can pull out of it. Not all of it will be necessarily applicable to people listening, but I, I think if you can't find two or three things to keep in the back of your mind on a daily basis, then you weren't listening hard enough. So here it is. <laughs> My father could have been a great comedian, but he didn't believe that that was possible for him. And so he made a conservative choice. Instead, he got a safe job as an accountant. And when I was 12 years old, he was let go from that safe job. And our family had to do whatever we could to survive. I learned many great lessons from my father, not the least of which was that you can fail at what you don't want. So you might as well take a chance on doing what you love. It's not the only thing he taught me, though. You know, I watched the effect of my father's love and humor and how it altered the world around me. And I thought, that's something to do. That's something worth my time. It wasn't long before I started acting up. You know, people would come over to the house and they'd be greeted by a seven-year-old throwing himself down a large flight of stairs. (laughs) They would say, what happened? And I would say, I don't know. Let's check the replay. I'd go back to the top of the stairs and come back down in slow motion. It was a very strange household. My father used to brag that I wasn't a ham, I was the whole pig. And he treated my talent as if it was his second chance. When I was about 28, after a decade as a professional comedian, I realized one night in LA that the purpose of my life had always been to free people from concern, just like my dad. And when I realized this, I dubbed my new devotion, the Church of Freedom from Concern. The Church of FFC. And I dedicated myself to that ministry. What's yours? How will you serve the world? What do they need that your talent can provide? That's all you have to figure out. As someone who's done what you're about to go and do, I can tell you from experience, the effect you have on others is the most valuable currency there is. Because everything you gain in life will rot and fall apart, and all that will be left of you is what was in your heart. My choosing to free people, <clears throat> my choosing to free people from concern got me to the top of a mountain. Look where I am. Look what I get to do. Everywhere I go, I'm, this, I'm going to get emotional because when I tap into this, it really is extraordinary to me. I did something that made people present their best selves to me wherever I go. I've often said that I wished people could realize all their dreams and wealth and fame and so that they could see that it's not where you're going to find your sense of completion. Like many of you, I was concerned about going out into the world and doing something bigger than myself until someone smarter than myself made me realize that there is nothing bigger than myself. Because life doesn't happen to you, it happens for you. How do I know this? I don't, but I'm making sound, and that's the important thing. That's what I'm here to do. Sometimes I think that's the only thing that's important, really. You know? It's just letting each other know we're here. 
reminding each other that we're part of a larger self. Your job is not to figure out how it's going to happen for you, but to open the door in your head. And when the door opens in real life, just walk through it. And don't worry if you miss your cue, because there's always doors opening. They keep opening. And when I say life doesn't happen to you, it happens for you, I really don't know if that's true. <laughs> I'm just making a conscious choice to perceive challenges as something beneficial so that I can deal with them in the most productive way. You'll come up with your own style. That's part of the fun. Oh, and、uh, why not take a chance on faith as well? Not religion, but faith. Not hope, but faith. I don't believe in hope. Hope is a beggar. Hope walks through the fire, and faith leaps over it. I used to believe that who I was ended at the edge of my skin, that I had been given this little vehicle called a body from which to experience creation. And though I couldn't have asked for a sportier model, <laughs> it was, after all, a loner and would have to be returned. <laughs> Then I learned that everything outside the vehicle was part of me too. And now I drive a convertible. <laughs> yeah, man, top down, wind in my hair. <laughs> Woo! I am elated. And truly, truly, truly excited to be present and fully connected to you at this important moment in your journey. I hope you're ready to open the roof and take it all in. You are the vanguard of knowledge and consciousness, a new wave in a vast ocean of possibilities. On the other side of that door, there's a world starving for new ideas, new leadership. I've been out there for 30 years. She's a wildcat. <laughs> oh, she'll rub up against your leg and purr until you pick her up and start petting her, and then out of nowhere she'll slap you in the face. <laughs> It can be rough out there, but that's okay because there's soft serve ice cream <laughs> with sprinkles. Sometimes it's okay to eat your feelings. <laughs> Now fear is going to be a player in your life, but you get to decide how much. You can spend your whole life imagining ghosts, worrying about the pathway to the future, but all there will ever be is what's happening here, and the decisions we make in this moment, which are based in either love or fear. So many of us choose our path out of fear, disguised as practicality. What we really want seems impossibly out of reach and ridiculous to expect. So we never dare to ask the universe for it. I'm saying, I'm the proof that you can ask the universe for it. Please. I am at the top of the mountain, and I was, and I the only. The only one I hadn't freed was myself, and that's when my search for identity deepened. I wondered who I'd be without my fame. Who would I be if I said things that people didn't want to hear, or if I defied their expectations of me? And that piece, that piece that we're after, lies somewhere beyond personality, beyond the perception of others, beyond invention and disguise, even beyond effort itself. You can join the game, fight the wars, play with form all you want, but to find real peace, you have to let the armor go. Your need for acceptance can make you invisible in this world. Don't let anything stand in the way of the light that shines through this form. Risk being seen in all of your glory. My soul is not contained within the limits of my body. My body is contained within the limitlessness of my soul. Now I'm always at the beginning. I have a reset button, and I ride that button constantly. <laughs> Once that button is functioning in your life, there's no story that the mind could create that will be as compelling. The imagination is always manufacturing scenarios, both good and bad, and the ego tries to keep you trapped in the multiplex of the mind.
Our eyes are not viewers, they are also projectors that are running a second story over the picture that we see in front of us all the time. Fear is writing that script, and the working title is, I'll Never Be Enough. I had a substitute teacher from Ireland in the second grade that told my class during morning prayer that when she wants something, anything at all, she prays for it and promises something in return, and, and she always gets what she wants. Well, I'm sitting at the back of the classroom, you know, thinking, well, my family can't afford a bike, you know. So I went home and I prayed for one. And I promised I would recite the rosary every night in exchange. Broke it. Broke that promise. <laughs> but two weeks later, I got home from school to find a brand new Mustang bike with a banana seat and easy rider handlebars. Yeah. <laughs> from fool to cool. My family informed me that I had won the bike in a raffle that a friend of mine had entered my name in without, any, without my knowledge whatsoever. So that type of thing has been happening to me ever since. And as far as I can tell, it's just about letting the universe know what you want and working toward it while letting go of how it comes to pass. No matter what you gain, ego will not let you rest. It will tell you that you cannot stop until you've left an indelible mark on the earth until you've achieved immortality. How tricky is this ego that it would tempt us with the promise of something we already possess? <laughs> Relax and dream up a good life. What would you think of that? Oh, wow. Didn't Jim Carrey do an awesome job? Oh, I think that was pretty good, wasn't it? <laughs> That was great. I really enjoyed that. I like when you find cool speeches by people. Did I, though? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, wow, that was really great. I enjoyed that. That was good. Okay. Mm. All right. Okay. I hope people f- enjoyed that. Oh, look, I'm sure they did. If they didn't, well, come on, guys. Tough. Yep. Tough cookies. Yep. Pull your socks up. Okay. Our second film mm. was The Highwaymen. <laughs> God. Pip, synopsis. Frank Hammer is asked by governor officials to stop the notorious Bonnie Parker and Clyde Barrow. Collecting his old comrade in arms, Manny Galt, um, along the way, they hunt the outlaws across the southern states of America. You didn't tell me Kevin fucking Costner was in the did you? No, I didn't, but I knew you wouldn't watch it if I did. <laughs> now, okay, Pip. Oh, let me just ask this question to you. <laughs> now, you watched the whole show, I'm assuming. I, wa- you, you I watched your, every film before I rock up way. here. Okay. Now, Woody Harrelson, always a delight. He's great. Sometimes, I, look, I sometimes hack on him like I did with um, uh, Planet of the Apes, um, the war one, uh, which, I, which I thought was probably a low point in his career. <laughs> <laughs> But by and large, look, I like Woody Harrelson because he is a very, how can I put it? He's a guy, you watch his face and he's got a thousand emotions chasing each other across his face. I think he's, the way he does this, uh, you know, I'm, you know, I've I've gone through this so much and it's hurting me, but I'm still going on it because I feel like I need something in my life. As an opposed to Cary Grant, I mean, Kevin Costner, (laughs) right? Who sat there through this whole fucking film like a block of fucking wood. He's supposed to be. Uh, I don't care. I think he's, in his mind, in his mind I think he's trying to be Clint Eastwood. (laughs) I do. And he's not Clint Eastwood. He's not a patch on Clint Eastwood. You know, racist old fuck that Clint Eastwood is. I said we had to put up a Kevin Costner film. (laughs) And you went, oh, no, I'm not watching the uh, Waterworld or whatever else. But is he shit or not? Because 